you take your Bible and turn to Matthew 6, with this being Memorial Day weekend, we do want to remember those who've given all in service to their country, the families and friends who've lost those sometimes closest to them. Stephanie's uncle, uh, who also happens to be Matt Tisdale's uh, father-in-law, lost his dad when he was young. Uh, his dad had been a fighter pilot of some renown during World War II and had gone on to serve in Korea. And in Korea, his P-51 was shot down. Uh, her uncle found a number of years back some footage of his dad being awarded a medal uh, in, in a, one of the World War II camps and, and, and one of the bases. And, and that, was, that was awesome, watching that and getting to see that, and how much Mike looked like his daddy. National Guard and Armory and Waycross was named in, in his memory. But we know firsthand those, those losses affect people for the rest of their life. Uh, and Mike was a young boy when he lost his dad. And so he's, he's had that, that missing piece all those years. And, and so we, we just want to continue to be praying for those folks. The church, interestingly enough, is often referred to as the army of God. That's obviously not politically correct anymore. And, and uh, when our denomination couldn't use a male reference to God, I'm sure it, it's, not, it's not one of those that you want to mention. Uh, but the parallel is drawn from so many places in Scripture. It tells us how we're supposed to act, uh, what, our, what, what our armor is. And the truth is we have people who lose their lives in service to God. It's this past week we had two missionaries that we lost in Haiti. Uh, who had given their lives to him and go and serve him to be in ministry to people in hurting places and gangs ambushed them and killed them. This past year, as we were getting ready for, for this year, early on, the, the, the missions committee started talking about trip where we're going to go back to Ecuador. And we're a little uneasy and, and struggling with we're, we're, what were we supposed to do. And as we gathered that night to, to make the final decision, we just said, you know, we just don't think it's safe enough right now with, with the, where that country is. And some of you remember the, the guys that broke into the, st the television station and were shooting people and all the other stuff. That, that happened that night. So that was the news that from the next day. And, and it was like incredible confirmation that uh, we'd made the right decision in that. This morning, I want to take the analogy of the church as the army of God. And I want to ask you, what do you do if you're wounded? What do we do when we're wounded? If you have your Bible, I invite you to join me as I read this morning from Matthew uh, chapter 6. And I'm stepping out of my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, I'm going back to, to the King James. So if I can't read these words, it's because this King James, the print, still is pretty small. Uh, but Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 12. Jesus says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this word. I ask again that you get me out of the way, that you speak your message to us in this place, that you bless this time and use it for your glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody's translation a little different than King James? Uh, if, if you're looking at NIV, uh, it's kind of a shock reading what we say every Sunday is the Lord's Prayer, and then all of a sudden you're reading the Bible and parts of it aren't there. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the, in, the New International Version translates it like this. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. What happened? Why did they make evil, evil one? And what happened to for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My study Bible's got a note, and the note says, R from evil, some late manuscripts won. And then it tells me some late manuscripts have, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. What that means is since the, the King James Version was, was written, 
through archaeology and, and just continued uh, searching out, they found Matt copies of Matthew's gospel that are older than what they used when they, when they translated the King James Version. And in those, those, those older versions, it does not have that almost doxology at the, at, at the end of the prayer for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Uh, it, it doesn't have that. Now, now look, that doesn't bother me in the least. In, in trying to find, make sure we're following the scriptures as much as we can, the earlier versions we get, the like, the, we like to find in the earlier versions because we feel like they're, they're, they're more historically accurate. But the King James Version has been around for a little, little while. And the people who wrote that, the people who translated that, truly believed and knew they were doing the work of God and it has blessed so many people. And that's why I wanted to use it this morning for the text as I looked at it. The truth I want to share today is there is a call to arms in the kingdom of God. The military does the terrific job in preparing you for what's coming. Well, they do the best job they can to get you prepared for combat. Nothing's going to prepare you. But they do as good a job as they can training troops to be as prepared as they are able to go into war. The church, not so much. We, we don't really delve a lot into to, to, to really preparing people for that. But in the military's training, there's a stark reality really from day one with, with some of the exercises and especially as they move into the live fire exercises and they give you the grenade and they've got a guy standing there with you because they know half of the people are going to freeze and, and somebody's got to get that grenade and, and get it in the grenade pit um, to the gas mask training. There's the reality, this is for real and I can get hurt and I can get killed. In the church, we've got all kind of false teachings from prosperity gospel to some kind of fake healing ministries to just bad theology. Preachers and teachers will say, if you just accept Jesus, you won't have any more problems. And I'm like, what? Why, why on earth would you tell anybody that? Jesus says in this world, you're going to have tribulations. What, what are you talking about? But unfortunately, some of the most wounded people in the world are those who've heard the gospel but they don't understand the cost. As somebody who's been wounded in serving God this morning, I want to offer you some lessons I've learned and some lessons I'm still really trying hard to live into, but I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm trying. The first one is make sure you're the one who's wounded. Today's society is so full of, of so many people who want to identify as the victim. Now, this is just me, and this is going to sit wrong with a lot of folks. I think one of the, the reasons for the groundswell at General Conference around the ordination issues, ordination issues and removing the restrictive language for the LGBTQ community was we had so many women pastors who thought people felt like I shouldn't be ordained. So for them, there was this reasoning that People said, I couldn't be ordained, and I've been ordained. And they say, these people can't be ordained, so I'm going to do everything I can to empower these people to be ordained. I think that, that was part of it. Too often in the church, we want to write off entire groups of people because somebody says they had a bad experience with one of them. One of them. People do it with the church all the time. People do that with pastors all the time. I'm not going back as long as they're there. Okay, you're going to stop associating with the people that you've called your church family for how long? Because you don't like something the preacher or, or your Sunday school teacher or somebody said? Okay, that's, that's grown up. You know, he, he, Barney Philpot and I were in seminary together, and Barney told me a story of when he was in, in Vietnam. And I think I've got this right. I know that the main gist of the story, and I, I think it was Barney's friend and not Barney. But he was sitting there, and his friend got, they were in the middle of a firefight. And his friend goes, starts screaming, I'm hit, I'm hit. And Barney, in the middle of the firefight, turns, as he's supposed to do, to, to look at his friend and try and, and, and help his friend. And he's looking all over the place, and he goes, wait, wait, where? You're not hit. And he goes, my backside, my whole backside's covered in blood. And, he, and Barney said, in the middle of that firefight, he started the biggest belly laugh. 
and said he could not stop laughing. And he finally looked at the guy and said, you're not hit. Your canteen is hit. That's not blood. It's water. You're okay. We want to make sure before anything else that we're actually wounded. Second, don't clutch your wound. Don't clutch your wound. You, you ever tried to help somebody that's been injured and they wouldn't take their hand off the wound to let you see it? Kids especially, you know, I, I hurt my elbow, I skimped my knee, and, and let me see it. Let me. No, 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 no. If you grew up in my generation or older, I understand that. Because what was that thing? Methylate, mercurochrome. I don't... This red stuff that they wanted to paint you with Anywhere you had an open wound that burned like everything and that was supposed to make it all better. And it's like, no, it doesn't. That or alcohol, if they're trying to bathe you down with those and you've got open wounds, I understand. But we didn't use those on, on the girls. And, but it was still this, no, no, no. We don't want anybody to see. Don't, if you're, if you're bleeding and you're the only person there, yes, put pressure on the wound. You know, take care of that. But the reality is, Jesus has the balm of Gilead, and we need to allow him access. You want to put pressure on bleeding wounds, but you preferably don't want to do that with dirty hands. And the reality is, all of our hands are dirty. Too often, we're like the little young girl that she goes to school, she goes to lunch, and she's prim and proper, and she sits down at the table, and she makes this big show of praying, Dear God... Thank you for preparing a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Um, if she was in middle school and the table was all girls, she may have had a point. <laughs> but beyond that, a lot of times we sit there and, and we just, we had that feeling that we're the only one and everybody's against us. I'm going to go back to that, but I've struggled with that all my life and I still have my moments. But if you grew up pulling for the Braves when I did, the Falcons, the Hawks, the Flames, and Georgia Tech, you got used to preparing for the worst. <laughs> Sometimes, and, and, and honestly, y'all, if you were pulling for Georgia back when I was growing up, same thing. So, so, Sometimes healing's painful. We receive a word of rebuke that's deserving, and we want to claim that we've been attacked. Unfortunately, we've got an awful lot of spiritual hypochondriacs, people who are trying to help us and speak truth into our lives are not the enemy. You're not wounded. Your feelings are hurt because somebody's told you the truth. Third, when we're wounded, we're required to help with the healing process. Just like a person who's having to have physical or occupational therapy after an injury or a surgery, we have to participate with an act of the will. And just like PT or OT can be such painful and hard parts in that healing process, this one's hard. We're supposed to forgive those who hurt us. Anybody completely there yet? I, I, I'm not. I am trying. But Scripture's pretty pointed. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is not optional equipment. It's like a gas mask. Gas mask or something, soldiers don't want to carry. We don't need that. It's just bulky. It's just, it takes up the chem suit, all that stuff. I don't need that. That just weights me down. And I mean, our soldiers, when they go into combat, the, the, the loads that they're carrying, I don't need that. You don't need it unless there's gas. And with us not forgiving somebody, it's almost like being there without a gas mask because that stuff will eat you alive. For us, it allows bitter roots to develop and we become bitter. The writer of Hebrews warns us, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Forgiveness is a command of God. Why? Because there's healing power in forgiveness. It frees us from being in bondage. God's forgiveness frees us from sin and restores us to a relationship with Him. But when we forgive others, we're no longer captive to what they did to us. And we're able to move on. I dare say forgiveness is more powerful than any hospital. Because God's forgiveness grants us complete healing and an eternal life with Him. And our forgiveness of others can free us up from things that have had us tied up in knots for years. I think I've told you, I'm not sure. I, I went to a, a prayer healing ministry one time. 
Uh, I was going through some stuff and, and, and had heard about this and, you know, I wasn't sure about it. And then I had a friend and, and, and they, they, they said, hey, I ran into a friend of yours and uh, doing this, this Kairos. And I'm like, really? And they said, yeah. And they told me his name. And they said, he, the guys with him said, he's completely different. So I called the guy and said, what's going on? He said, come turkey hunting and I'll tell you. So I went and we went turkey hunting and then went and grabbed something to eat and went back to the house to eat with he and his wife. And he said, I said, what happened? He said, well, I went through this thing and it was the same thing I was looking at going through. And I'm like, you're kidding. And he comes like, no. I'm like, okay. So I went in and I scheduled this thing and I went, I, I had to drive up close to Atlanta to, to, to do the one that I did. And it was guided prayer. And they would tell me what to ask God. And there, there, was, there were two people who were kind of directing me. There was a couple of folks that were praying for me. And, and, and we're going through. And I, I've, I've put an awful lot of stuff down. I, I've forgiven a lot of people and, and a, lot of, a lot of hurtful things in my life. And, and finally they said, you know, ask God, is there anything else that I need? Anything else? And I asked him, and this picture showed up in my brain. I, I mean, it was just, I, I, I was in kindergarten in the fifth, I was, you know, kindergarten. And there was an incident. And I did what we had been taught to do. And the teacher reprimanded me. The teacher took care of the situation. And then she used me as an example of what not to do for the rest of the class. And I was devastated at the time. I mean, that, I was in kindergarten. I was, I was in my late 30s, early 40s, or even later when, when I'm doing this prayer healing. And I'm like, are you kidding me, God? Kindergarten? But subconsciously, I had been carrying that and holding that beef against that teacher for all those years. That night when I left that time of prayer healing, I was lighter because I had laid so many things down at the foot of the cross. I'd argue that forgiveness is stronger than faith because we have evidence of why we should believe. Most of us don't have evidence that we'll be better by forgiving. That's why I think God tells us to do it in such a strong manner. You may think you're wounded, but if you don't forgive, you're honestly forgiving, you're, you're honestly wounding yourself that much more. Maybe to the point it would seem that you're excluded from heaven. Not my words, God's words. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive their sins. You won't, your Father will not forgive your sins. I'm not saying I understand this. I'm not saying I can put it all into practice. I'm trying. I know we can't, I can't wait till I feel like it because if I do that, I'm never going to forgive. We forgive because we're told to and because Jesus Christ has given us the example. I've heard people say, well, I'll forgive them as soon as they ask. To forgive someone is to, is to release them from a debt without any compensation. I know people who say, I'll forgive them, but I better not see their face. They better not speak to me. You know, that's our way of claiming compensation in other ways. The scary thing to me is we take the Lord's Prayer that we pray every week, if we take it seriously, more people are praying themselves into hell because every week we are asking God to forgive us as we forgive others. Now, the struggle. We cannot confuse soreness with the original wound. That's one of the big problems with forgiveness. Our feelings are confusing. We consciously forgive somebody and then someone says their name and all that stuff comes rushing back and hits us in the face again. That anger comes rushing back. Corey Ten Boone, who once spoke in this church, said that a priest gave her a visual understanding of that. She said the priest talked about ringing the bells. And you picture ringing church bells and pulling the ropes and, and, and the bells ringing. He said they stopped ringing the bells, but the bells kept ringing because they'd been set in motion. You can for, forgive somebody and still hear the bell, still, still see the scar, still have that memory. That's not necessarily connected to God and forgiveness. Forgive and, and, and just keep trying to move on. Fourth, we got to grow in love so we're not as easily wounded the next time. Some people have a history of being wounded over and over and over and never can seem to come into spiritual maturity. 
They take the victim role and they want to focus on the hurts and those who hurt them instead of moving on with life. You remember the description of love in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is patient, love is kind, it is not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. According to God's definition of love that the Holy Spirit gave to Paul, love isn't easily wounded, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. And it always perseveres. Some people, like me, tend to take everything personally and have a hard time dismissing things as nothing. You ever watch the Lion Cubs playing? It's the coolest thing, the way they play, and they, they're all over each other and everything else, and they're crawling all over the mama, and then they start chewing on the mama's ear. And after a while, the mama sits there, and not with the claw, but with the paw, she swats that thing with a force that would throw us upside down against a tree, and it goes tumbling. But you know what? I've never seen a lion cub sit over there and go sulk and go, my mama doesn't love me anymore. It goes back. May not bite on the ear for a while, but it goes back and it's still there. Too many times we get so hurt about something, one event that somebody we love did to us and we can't get past it. Supposedly, as we mature, we learn to let words bounce off of us, but it takes some growing up in other areas besides just getting older and taller, or in my case, older and shorter. Um, Paul, at the end of that chapter on love, right before he says, and now these three remain, said, when I was a child, I taught like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Can we all agree that we're going to try and be more adult-like? Some people believe everybody's against them and everything's a personal attack, and I've struggled with that. I had a, a, I've talked to y'all about Jim Moy, the youth minister I work with, and Jim one day looked at me and he said, do you realize a lot more people are in your corner than are against you? And he may as well have taken a two by four and hit me upside the head. I mean, it was just like, what? Why, how can you say that? Do you realize there are a whole lot more people in your corner than are against you. They may not agree with what you think on an issue, but they love you and they're for you and they're in your corner. That goes to people here and people who've outrun us to heaven. The writer of Hebrews says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you've forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And your hardship is a discipline. God is treating you as sons for what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile me. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he writes two things I think we need to remember when we're wounded. In 2 Corinthians 6, 
He says, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance and troubles, hardships and distress, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. And in 2 Corinthians 12, that's why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This morning, if you've got a hurt that you've been hanging on to, I invite you to lay it at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, I just can't carry this anymore. I need you to help me forgive them and move on. And I need you to take this. And God, I can't forgive them in my power. But your power can do it. Maybe you're here, you've never made a decision for Jesus. I'd love to talk to you. Maybe you're here, there's just somebody, something you want to pray about, this altar is open. Maybe you've been visiting with us and you say, this is the church I want to be a part of. You're part of us, whether you ever come into the role of the church or not. But if you want to come in, we'd love to receive you today. As Pat leads us in our hymn of invitation.